Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call the meeting of the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District Board of Trustees to order for June 2nd, 2022. Ask the Secretary, please call the roll. Mayor Lai. Here. President Brown. Here. Mr. Sula. Here. Mayor DeGeer, present. Mayor Bachi. Present. Ms. Dumas. Here. Ms. Chambers. Here. Present. Thank you. Uh, now I ask for the approval of the minutes from our May 19, 2022 meeting. So moved. Motion by Mayor Bachi. Second. Second by Ms. Dumas. Is there a question? There's no question. The minutes will stand approved as they are printed. Now I ask uh, Madam CEO if anyone has signed up to speak during the public session portion of our agenda on a specific agenda topic. They have not, Mr. President. Okay, then we will have your report, please. Thank you, President Brown and members of the board. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Beginning with COVID-19, we have two active cases among district employees and two employees with COVID-like symptoms. So this brings us to 220 confirmed cases since the beginning of the pandemic, with 218 folks recovered and returned to work. So as you know, beginning this year, we expanded the eligibility for our cost savings programs. These expansions included raising the eligibility from 200% of the federal poverty level to 250% and then adding renters who pay their sewer and stormwater bills. Constance Huck and her team also established a goal of 2,000 new accounts added each year to at least one of our cost saving programs based on the gap that we know exists between those that are eligible and those that are actually participating in the program. So as we close the first quarter of 2022, we wanted to give you an update on where we stand against those goals and then also specifically a report out from one of our first of six outreach events that we recently completed. So I'll turn to Constance to take us through that. Thank you and good, good afternoon, um, President Brown and members of the board. So this will be the first quarter report on our cost saving outreach and enrollment um, process and you'll see some of the successes that we um, have had. Just to remind you of the, five, of the six programs that we have available to our customers that allow them some cost savings. Um, these are they, uh, Homestead Program, which allows for a 40% discount. Um, our Affordability Program, another 40% discount. Um, crisis Assistance, up to $300 per year. Summer Sprinkling, Plumbing and Sewer Repair, and of course the Regional Stormwater Management fee credits are, are, fee credits are all um, opportunities for our customers to receive some savings on their bill. So the issues that we've been trying to resolve, the um, problem that we're trying to solve, is one, the underutilization of our programs. Um, some are utilized more than others, but that is uh, what we were going after in this first quarter, really pushing hard to get more people enrolled in our programs. And also the issue of renters. Renters in our service area um, experience more poverty than homeowners, um, and most of our programs except crisis, the crisis assistance program, had not been eligible um, for renters. And so we wanted to solve that problem as well. So here are some of our solutions, a couple that Kyle have mentioned already, um, and which surfaced in the rate study. One is to increase, we increased the um, threshold um, for, uh, from 200% of the federal poverty level to 250% of the poverty level, making um, a family of four um, who makes about $60, $61,000 eligible for the program. So, um, our rate consultants indicated that that would increase the number of eligible um, uh, neighbors of ours um, by 20,000 people. Um, the second, um, which Kyle also mentioned, was to um, uh, include renters who pay their sewer and water bill in our affordability program. That will increase another 220,000 people eligible in our service area. So those two adjustments alone um, make our programs eligible for about 40,000 additional customers. So that was, uh, those were our first solutions. Secondly, we um, are increasing our outreach to potential customers. We have developed partnerships with other organizations. Um, we have dedicated one of our customer service representatives to outreach and enrollment um, in addition to her other um, assignments. 
Um, we have also worked very closely, even more closely than in the past, with CHN Housing Partners. We support their Water Champions program. It's a program that um, um, has individuals going out into the community talking about affordability programs. Um, and um, they particularly target libraries in our service area where they go, go on a regular basis and talk to customers. Um, we also, um, many of you know about the federal funding um, called LIWAP, which is the Low Income Household <coughs> Water Affordability Program. It's modeled after the LIHEAP program, which has been around for a long time. Um, so CHN and Step Forward are the two organizations in our community who are administering that program, and they've had some difficulty with staffing. And so we have provided three of our customer service staff st to assist them. They go Tuesday and Thursday evenings and Saturday mornings, and they get on the phone, talk to customers, and help them get folks enrolled in the LIWAP program. So that's another assistance that we have been providing, even though we are not personally administering that program. We also um, wanted to partner with the county, and this has been extremely successful. They have a um, homestead program also. This is for tax, um, for low-income homeowners. It provides them a discount on their tax bill. Well, their income requirements are very similar to ours. So we asked them for their list. They gave, them eight, they gave us 80,000 um, folks to <laughs> review. So that was a lot of fun for Ken's uh, staff. They went through. We pulled out our customers. We pulled out the customers who were already enrolled. And so we know specifically who um, could be eligible. And in batches of 5,000, we are sending out letters specifically to those individuals to say, hey, you're on the county homestead. You are very likely eligible for our program and here's how you can sign up. We're trying to eliminate some of the barriers and going directly to people who we know are eligible. So we are waiting to see the outcome of that and then we will do another 5,000 from that list um, as we work through. Um, we also scheduled are scheduling six utility resource fairs. These are not um, classic outreach events where you you know sign up, you have a table, people come in, you give them information. This is really where people can get signed up for programs. And I'll talk about our first one in just a moment. Um, we are continuing to include cost savings in all of our contacts. Our watershed team leaders, when they go out into the community. Um, uh, our outreach staff, our educational outreach, all, we always talk about our cost-saving opportunities when we have a touch point with our customers. Um, we also outreach to San Antonio Water and Sewer. They're like the gold standard of getting folks enrolled. They have like 59% of eligible um, San Antonians, I think that's how you call them. San Antonios are en enrolled in their cost-saving programs. They are, are very aggressive in their outreach and we learned a lot from, from interfacing with them. Um, so our first utility fair was held on May 21st, and I really have to thank um, Councilman Conwell. Um, he was in the office, we mentioned this concept, he gave us a date, he worked with us, and um, he selected the location. Uh, this, uh, the way this worked was we outreached to folks and we thank our communication staff for the outreach that they did. People signed up and registered. Um, our customer service staff called and confirmed with everyone who registered. We asked them to bring their documents. We have to thank our partners because Dominion came, uh, First Energy, um, Cleveland Water, um, uh, WPC, and CPP all came. Um, and because we had the names of the individuals ahead of time, they pulled all their documents. So we had their, their bills right there um, um, so that they could get signed up um, with CHN Housing Partners and um, uh, Cleveland Connections right on the spot. And so it was a really successful event. We had hoped to, um, our goal was 60 um, residents signed up. We signed up 111 people. So that was our very first one, and um, it went very well. And we also gave them um, our
We also gave them this as a handout. It's a document holder um, so people can put their information in. We have one for each of you. Um, you probably don't have your key documents in a cardboard box at home like some of us. Um, so you might want to, um, if you do, you might want to take one and, and use it. So it went extremely well. These are just some of the pictures from the event. So first quarter, um, new enrollees. These are not people who are signing up, um, you know, or renewing their um, participation. New enrollees, we've enrolled 1,133 people. So we're very um, excited about our success thus far. As you know, we had a 2,000 um, new enrollees a year goal. And um, this is how it breaks down um, in terms of our program. Summer sprinkling, homestead, um, our sewer affordability program crisis. So upcoming, we have utility fairs scheduled in um, Councilman Starr, Ward 5's um, Ward, um, Councilwoman Santana and Councilwoman Spencer um, are combining uh, and they are doing a utility fair on the west side. And the city of Richmond Heights, the mayor has asked us for a utility fair and the city of East Cleveland. So we have one slot left for this year. We want to do six. So we are looking for a, um, a final and we hope it will be Mayor DeGeter's uh, community in Parma. Um, we uh, the response we are looking for the response to the letters from that from the county's list and how that shakes out for us. Um, we're going to continue to track our progress and explore new partnerships, and uh, we're also working with CHN to increase the amount of documentation that people have to have in order to sign up, which is a major barrier for folks. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take questions. Excellent program. Very good. <laughs> Excellent progress. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. That's uh, exactly. That's more than we've talked about it. So, so it's great. It's good to see that you're also targeting areas that you, that you know you have folks who are eligible. Right. Uh, for so that I think that's great. Um, I I think maybe the ability to. Um, Perhaps as a as a follow up, uh, at some point as people get signed up, somehow message back to those communities uh, some of the benefits for for the folks who have signed up. Mm -hmm. So those who are still straggling, kind of hear that oh I could have gotten this, or I can still get this uh, if I'm eligible. So um, thank you for that comment, um, uh, President Brown. It really uh, blew up on Twitter. <laughs> and so okay. people were, were, you know, contacting each other, and so we got a lot of um, buzz around. And I really want to thank the government affairs and customer service staff here because they really worked hard on this um, effort to make it happen. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Constance. President Brown, that's our report. I, I do just want to highlight, as Constance pointed out, the level of effort that she and her team put to continuously working this problem. And you can see that it is bearing fruit, and we have more work to do. But... We're all very appreciative. So very thank you. Very good. Um, related but not, uh, I think a couple of board meetings uh, previously, we had a discussion around um, foreclosure and, the, the, and what was happening down at the state level that they were still making noise about um, basically uh, allowing folks who uh, were delinquent on their utility bills to not be responsible uh, for uh, uh, final payment. Uh, and I know that we've worked out, so we've worked through a number of things with the county uh, to get ourselves in a much better position, but uh, uh, the state reps and centers were doing what they do down there. So is there an, an update or will there be an update on uh, where that stands at, at an appropriate point in time? Yes, we can provide that update. We did, as you know, uh, President Brown, provide comments on that Senate Bill 193, um, which would have removed the ability to certify delinquent accounts. Um, we will continue to update on that as well. As you obviously are aware, Senator Williams has, has resigned, um, so we're still trying to confirm sort of the status of that bill. All right. Thank you. 
All right, anything else for the CEO? If not, we'll go to our action items. Okay, let's start with uh, authorization to advertise. Uh, starting with authorization to publish notice calling for bids in accordance with Bahari Bites Code Section 6119.10 for the purchase of 10 vehicles, anticipated expenditure $741,500. Request for authorization to publish notice calling for bids in accordance with Bahara Revised Code Section 6119.104 Southerly PLC Replacement Project with an anticipated expenditure of $17 million. Move to adopt 177 and 17822. Motion by Mr. Sulik. Second. Uh, second by Ms. Chambers. Uh, question, if it's just if you could, 178.22. Um, this is the third plant, third <coughs> final plant, it looks like, that will be undertaking this uh, initiative with, it is a three-year program, so it's going to take a little while for us to get through the plant, and then from there we go to, as I understand it, a collection system, so uh, that's a lot of spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> and that one isn't even bad, believe it or not. <coughs> Yes, President Brown, members of the board, um, this is the third of three planned under APM phase one, phase two. So Westley was completed first, so that's completely done. <clears throat> Easterly just started construction back in April, and then um, the collection system will come after Southerly. <clears throat> I will point out we do anticipate another one coming up here in the future. Um, as part of the Southerly PLC replacement, we did not include the REF facility. Um, that was intentional for a couple reasons. First of all, the PLCs in the REF facility did not reach the end of their useful life, but we also wanted to um, extend the contracts over a longer period of time because obviously this is the first of future ones too. Obviously these PLCs will not last forever, so it was intentional to spread those out over a longer period of time. Great, thank you. Uh, no other questions without objection. They're approved. Resolution 177 and 178-22. Thank you. Let's go. Authorization to issue requests for proposals. Authorization to issue an RFP in accordance with Ohio Revised Code Chapter 6119 to implement the 2023 Green Infrastructure Grants Program for the combined sewer area. So moved. Motion by Mayor Bach. <coughs> Second. Second by Ms. Dumas. Uh, question. Just uh, this is to go out for the communities to uh, submit uh, for the ability to uh, participate in the program at this point? That is correct. We have a slide to, to kind of show you the history. So this is a request for proposals. We want to get proposals from communities and other entities uh, that we will review. It's a competitive process. 1.5 million is in the, the budget for 2023. This is the history of the awards, both in how much we've awarded in green infrastructure grants and projections on the reduction of stormwater getting into the combined sewer system. So to date, we're almost we're approaching 11 million in grants and almost 33 million in stormwater removal. Anything you take out of a combined sewer system is is a good thing from a capacity standpoint. So these are pretty these are really great projects. 1.5 million for 2023. We instituted design only mm -hmm. uh, grants in 2022 to kind of tee up some of the entities in getting better uh, projects for construction. And we feel that's very beneficial, so we'll do that again in 23. All right, and then you mentioned to me uh, conversations we're having with the county. We are having conversations with the county. They like our green infrastructure program. I forget the amount, $1.1 million tentatively slated to come to us from the county to do additional green infrastructure grants. We'll come to you with an agreement to accept those funds and get into an agreement with the county. And then we'll send out another request for proposals once we receive those funds. Great, thank 
Thank you. No other question without objection that it's approved. <coughs> Resolution 179-22. All right, let's go authorization to purchase. Uh, starting with authorization to purchase polychem metallic sludge collector replacement parts as needed from sole source vendor Pelton environmental uh, products necessary for the primary settling tanks used at easterly and southerly wastewater treatment plants and the total amount not to exceed $250,000. Request for authorization enter into a one year agreement with sole source vendor Ossisoft LLC for software maintenance and support for district's process data management system, PDMS. Application for a period January 1, 2022 through May 31, 2023, an amount not to exceed $64,350. Uh -oh. Okay, and then the request for authorization to purchase a three year enterprise agreement with Dale Marketing LLP under the state of Ohio cooperative purchasing program necessary for Microsoft Office 365 license subscriptions and Windows and SQL <coughs> server uh, software maintenance from July 1, 2022 through June 30, 2025 in an amount not to exceed $1,122,000. <coughs> for adoptions of resolutions 180 through 18322. Second. Uh, motion by Mayor Ali, second by Ms. Chambers. Question. No question, then and without objection, they approve. Resolutions 180 through 182-22. Okay, let's go. Uh, authorization to enter into agreement. Starting with uh, authorization to enter into agreements with AIG slash Lexington National. Insurance Company, Travelers Insurance, Berkeley National Insurance, Arch Insurance Group, Inc. Chubb Limited, uh, Resilience uh, Insurance, and Lloyds of London for their respective portions of the district's operational insurance program for the period July 1 to 2022 uh, through June 30, 2023, as presented, a total amount. For all agreements not to exceed $1,338,611, including allowance, request for author authorization enter into an agreement with the City of Cleveland and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History's Green City Blue Lake Institute as fiscal agent to sponsor district-related projects, including an offering of 10 rain barrel workshops for homeowners led by participating uh, youth to be implemented under Mayor Justin and M. Bibbs 2022 Youth Summer Employment Program, an amount not to exceed $20,000. Uh, and then finally, request for authorization to enter into a one-year partnership agreement with Cuyahoga County Solid Waste District for its Cuyahoga County Household Hazardous Waste Program to assist in the cost to collect and transport house household hazardous waste and a total amount of $75,000. Move to adopt 183 through 185.22. Motion by Mr. Sulik. Second. Second by Ms. Dumas. Question, if, if you could, just on the 183.22, uh, these are insurances cover a number of areas of concern for us. So if you could just kind of briefly give us an overview of what this does for us, because there there is there are um, protections <coughs> both for uh, staff, employees, and also the board uh, as it relates to uh, <coughs> uh, 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 contracts and agreements, etc. So, uh, Yes. Uh, good afternoon, President Brown, members of, of the board. I'm going to ask uh, Shola Ojo, our manager of finance and compliance, to give a brief presentation to outline the insurance program in general, as well as some specific discussion of this renewal. Uh, we also have uh, Julie Reed from our broker, Willis, here to help answer any questions the board may have. As show is coming up, I will just mention that this renewal was a little more smooth than prior years. We've seen some significant volatility, specifically in property, double-digit increases in recent years. This year, our, our total increase is about 6%. Um, so that's better than we've seen in recent years, but there are areas where it's higher and lower than that. So, Shola. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Ken. Good afternoon, President Brown and fellow board members. Good afternoon. So, I am here to go over the insurance renewal update. 
and we'll just provide some slides that kind of talks about the type of alliance that we have in the coverage and some increases that we saw in the total portfolio itself. So just a quick overview, our renewal period goes from July 1st to June 30th. So our current renewal period is going to end June 30th, um, 2022. And um, we also have our insurance broker, Willis Towers, here today, Julie Reed, she's with us today. And they really help us put our insurance program together. So basically, they have three main activities that they help us with, which is to first help us procure insurance. And um, secondly, to also provide us with market updates and trends that are going on in the market. And um, also to help us with administrative duties that we might see during the renewal period. So currently we are in the four-year four year agreement or the six-year agreement with, the, with Willis <coughs> on the Board Authority 348-18. So we should be going up for um, a renewal with, the, with our broker in, the, in 2024. So before we start our process, we have what we call renewal activities. So those activities actually go out throughout the entire year, and we kind of break them out by a quarterly approach. That's true. Thank you. So our first, in the first quarter of the year, which is January, February, March, we do our kickoff, which we, uh, we meet with Willis, our insurance broker, finance, to kind of discuss what the market is looking like and what the expectations are going to be for the year. And then based on those conversations, we do what we have, the renewal strategy. So the strategy could be focused on, okay, maybe we should focus on a particular line rather than focusing on the entire portfolio and to kind of make sure we can get the best premium we can get on the market. So for us, for this renewal period, our main focus was cyber, just because of all the activities going on with cyber mm -hmm. insurance and the ransomware in the, just throughout the entire country. So we focused a lot on the cyber insurance renewal, make sure we went out to market to try to engage as much vendor as we could. So once we go through our renewal strategy, then we have Willis go out to actually see what's, what the market is looking like. So they go ahead and do their pre-activities, and then from there we start filling out the various application and data collection that we want to send out to the, to the vendors to kind of take a look at our program itself in the district. So that's what we do in the first quarter. Then in the second quarter, we submit our application and the information to the, to the market, hopefully with a focus that they would then give us some quotes on basically what they are seeing and how we are doing with our own portfolio as well. So once we get through the quotes, we meet with the C-suites to talk to them about what we saw in the market what the training was looking like throughout the whole period of talking to various vendors and the appetite for our insurance program. Mm -hmm. So we meet with the executive team, we discuss with them what we saw, and then we then come for approval to the board to get a approval for the renewal period, which is what we're doing today. So after we go through the um, approval of the insurance renewal, then we go into the third quarter, making sure that we actually pay for all the premiums that we got. And then we also get our binding agreements from the insurance vendors, just to let us know what our policies are looking like based on our limits and the retention that we have as well. And then we do a little bit of audit, because when we send them the information to get the data collection, for example, they ask us how many employees do we have at the district. So at that time, the data could change based on people leaving, retiring, or termination. And then we update that information because that can change our premium price as well. So we do that audit, make sure everything is set with the, with the vendors, get them paid. And then in the fourth quarter, we have what we call a loss control site visits, particularly with, the, with AIG. So that visit from AIG is really for them to come to our facilities to see how we're doing in the facilities as far as the safety measures that we're taking in the facilities. So their focus is usually on the fire suppression system. So they look at, okay, hey, you guys have these controls in place. Therefore, that will also impact the premium that we pay in the next renewal activity. 
And what they also do is provide to us some recommendations of what we can improve on. So we meet with our, um, our facilities managers to discuss those improvements as well. And then we try to see if we can actually implement those recommendations. So we don't only do that for property. As we go through this slide, we'll also talk about the IT-related activities we do for cyber as well. So once we get through the renewal, we do have things that are all year activity based, such as incidents and claims reporting. So we do have incidents that happen, such as MVM, so model vehicle um, collision and stuff like that. So when those incidents do happen, we do have to report the claims to the, to the insurance company, hopefully for them to help us with the process and to maybe get some um, reduction on the expenses for an MVA crash that we might have had. Also, we also pay attention to what's going on in the market throughout the year just because there's a lot of volatility that does happen. For example, with cyber, we saw 100% increase in cyber this year. So we want to make sure we're up to date. And then not only being up to date with the market, but with the trends of what is going on in the market as well as far as activities we can, we can use to improve the controls that we can put in place for cybersecurity or property as, as I just described. The other thing we, we tend to make sure we do is to have risk assessment meetings with the different departments to kind of talk about what risk area we're looking at and then also site visits as well for maybe looking at our equipment to make sure that those equipments are up to date and they are working properly as well. So. So the next few, few slides, we're just going to go through all the different line of coverages that we have. We, can, we have an extensive line of coverages to make sure that we're protected with the insurance um, portfolio that we have. So we'll start with the first main one, which is the general liability. Under the general liability, we have a few other lines in there. And the first one is the commercial general liability. So this insurance protects us against coverage from third party property damages or bodily injury allegedly caused by the insured, which would be us, the sewer district in this case. So really that is more for our regular business operations. So we have um, that coverage to protect us if someone wants to sue us for um, any damages to the property or physical damage to them as well. The next line of coverage we have is the employee benefits liability. And this insurance coverage is for employees for the administration of the benefits um, program, such as maybe we might have a failure to inform the employee on the type of um, benefit program that we do have. So there's a coverage for that. The next coverage we have is the law, law enforcement liability. So the law enforcement liability is just exactly what it says. So it's for law enforcement related activities that you know we could get um, a suit for uh, a, a, um, a wrongful act committed by our law enforcement um, personnel, which would be our security group. And then we also have the public entity management liability. So this is more for protection for the executive team and the boards in case if they have any um, lawsuit that comes from that. Then the next one we have is the employee entertainment employment related practice liability. And this is related to any various um, employment related lawsuits from wrongful termination, discrimination, workplace harassment, or retaliation in the, in the workplace. And finally, under the general liability, we have the stop gap. So the stop gap provides employees liability coverage against claims of negligence and protects employer from being held liable for work injury or illness. <clears throat> so this is more tied to workers' compensation. So for example, if an employee gets injured in the job and they decided that we were negligent on protecting them, then we have this coverage to protect us against that as well. The next one is our business auto premium. Again, this is something that everyone is familiar with, which is auto insurance. And this also protects us for when we have collisions and um, if we do get a, a lawsuit from related to those collisions with the district vehicles or automobiles that we have. Again, one of the coverage that is included is for uninsured, underinsured, and physical damage coverage as well. 
And as you can see, we had an increase of 11% in this coverage. So under the general liability, we have excess or extra insurance, basically. So we have primary insurance, and then we have secondary insurance. So our secondary insurance is the umbrella and access insurance. So the umbrella particularly, our coverage right now is about $10 million, I believe, our limit on that. So this covers large unexpected events that can have a devastating impact on business, brand reputation, and financial stability. The policy provides excess limits above those supplied by the primary underlying policies, which include general liability, other liability, and employer's liability. And we'll show you a total scheme of how this all comes to get on the last slide so you can see how the insurance portfolio does work with the district. The other extra coverage or secondary coverage we have is the excess liability. So this serves as an extra layer of protection for losses in excess of primary and umbrella policy limits, but does not provide broader coverage under those underlying policies. So for example, with the umbrella, you could get extra coverage that you don't have in your policy, in your primary policy to protect you, but the excess doesn't do that. It's an excess on the primary and the umbrella as well. So in total, our casualty or general liability, what is expiring right now is about $370,000. Our um, renewal for this year is going to be $384,000, which is just a 4% increase on the total um, line of coverages for that line. The next um, insurance coverage that we have is the excess workers' compensation. So we have um, we are self-insured at the district for workers' compensation, which means that whenever employees get in injured on the job, we pay directly for their medical um, medical bills for related to those injuries. So what we did since we're self-insured is to have an excess coverage of excess. This is the excess workers' compensation. So what that is supposed to do is if there's a catastrophic injury to an employee, this coverage will kick in. So our retention amount is about $800,000 for the excess workers' compensation. On the next slide, we have our crime insurance. So this coverage addresses the most common threats to organization, including losses to employee dishonesty, forgery, computer fraud, and front transfer fraud. So this is really more for internal. If we do have any kind of um, employee theft, it could be monetary or it could be um, physical as well. So this insurance is meant to protect against those losses that might arise from those. So our biggest line of insurance is the property. As you can see, the expiring coverage is about $625,000. We are proposing to have a renewal of $661,000, which is an 8% change in the, in the previous renewal. So the one thing we saw in the past few years were double-digit increases in this line. This is the first year that we've actually seen a single-digit increase, which, is, which speaks to the volume of work that we've been doing at the plants and um, our approach with the insurance provider, AIG, because we have a very close relationship with them. Like I said, we do this loss control site visits where they come in to take a look at our facilities to see what we're doing. And when we do this type of control, it shows them that we are really on our game when it comes to making sure that our facilities are safe. So this year is a little increase, but uh, not, too, not too much of a change from last year. Briefly, Shola, uh, on property, one item that I did want to mention for the board, as you recall, when we went through the rate study, um, these, the property insurance covers our physical facilities, the plant, this building, EMSC, our pump stations. We do not have property insurance on our underground facilities, so the sewers, the, the storage tunnels. That's a part of the component why we have the reserves that we have we are self-insured for a catastrophic event in the collection system. So I did just want to point that piece out. 
And um, we also have terrorism coverage. Um, again, this is for um, if there's a terrorism event that happens and there's a lot of um, damages to the property. This year, we actually saw a reduction in the premium of 33%, which was, again, speaks to our relationship with our insurance brokers and then going to the market to actually market this line of coverage. Also, we also have a good story to tell as well, and we saw that during this renewal period. So the one that everyone is definitely interested in is the cyber insurance. And as you can see, we have 100% increase in that line. So basically the coverage is, to, is for business with a company. It helps us with cyber breaches, data, um, data issues that we might get from an external party and also ransomware. So this increases that we saw is really tied to what's going on in the market. So the market has seen a lot of ransomware activities. And throughout the year, or throughout this renewal period, we spend a lot of time focusing on this coverage. And we spend a lot of time discussing the controls that we could put in place. So this included meeting with Willis Finance and the IT department, especially the security group, to talk about the various controls that we can implement to protect us from external um, external um, security issues that can come into our network system. So going into our plan this year is to continuously review what's going on in the IT world, basically when it comes to security, meeting with the IT team, and then having Willis provide us information on the new measures that are out there that we can use to help us um, prevent us from cyber issues. So uh, one of the main things that we did this past year was to implement the MFA. And Shall we can discuss that at the executive session okay. uh, two weeks from today. Yeah, so we'll, we'll have further update on that regarding that. So in total, so that goes through all our different line of coverages. So our expiring premiums from the last renewal period was $1.2 million. Our current is about $1.3 million, and we're asking for a $20,000 allowance based on the audits that could happen for the invoices. Like Ken said, this is a 6% um, increase, and this is one of the lower increases that we've seen in the total portfolio. And um, we think what we currently have is good enough for us for the protection that we need in the, in the sewer district. So this, this final graph chart is to kind of show you the different portfolio just in one, um, in one view. And as you can see with the casualty lines, the commercial, the employee, the stopgap, the law enforcement liability, we have those umbrella on top of it and we also have the excess on top of it. For cyber, for cyber we also have excess cyber liability, so we have a primary coverage. We have an excess coverage to help us um, protect, to increase our limits. So, for example, our total limit for the cyber is about $2 million. So, um, if you have any questions, I'll take any questions now. But if not, that will conclude the presentation. Questions? Ms. Dubas? Can, uh, can you go over one more time, uh, Shola, how the workers' comp works? So, the workers' comp, we have a, we're self-insured with the workers' comp. So basically what that means, again, is whenever there's an injury on the job, we pay directly for those injuries. So we, um, I believe our, we have Hunter Consulting as our consultant to help us manage that. But once we get into a catastrophic event, we do have what the excess workers' compensation line of coverage. But that is supposed to eat when we go over a certain threshold of the expenses per claim. So that um, excess is $800,000. Mr. President. Sir? One quick question as it relates to anything that we impact outside of our properties. If we had a catastrophic event at one of the plants that impact the river, the lake, et cetera, would that be where we'd get state and federal help to, with that? Or we have insurance that would cover that kind of a... So I would like to defer to our insurance broker for that. <laughs> That's a broker question. a little bit more technical. <laughs> uh, good 
Good afternoon, President Brown and Board. Good um, afternoon. I'm Julie Reed. I'm with Willis Towers Watson. I'm the representative for your uh, for your uh, insurance broker and worked very closely with Shoal and the executive team through this renewal um, and have for the past several years. Um, currently, the district does not purchase independent pollution liability coverage. It is something that we have talked about in the past um, for different risks that are potential for the district. Um, so you would right now need to look for um, state and or federal help if there were to be an environmental impact um, from a result of an event. Typically, that is not covered under a standard liability or property policy. Excuse me, policy. Super. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. Any other Except questions I can address? Reserve activity? Yes. yes. <laughs> Let's do this. All right. Other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, that said, then without objection, those resolutions are approved. Resolutions 183 through 185-22. Uh, let's go authorization enter into contract. Authorization enter into a three-year requirement contract with Smith and Obie Service Company under the State of Ohio Cooperative Purchasing Program necessary for HVAC slash our repairs as needed, preventive maintenance at all district facilities and amount not to exceed one million six hundred thousand dollars. Also request for authorization to enter into a requirement contract with Unistrut Service Company for purchase of rooftop fall pre prevention equipment in an amount not to exceed two hundred thousand dollars. Move to adopt one eighty six through one eighty seven. Motion by Ms. Dumas. Second. Second by Mayor Bachi. Question. Question without objection. They approve. Resolution one eighty six and one eighty seven dash. Thank you. Let's go authorization to amend agreement starting with authorization to amend 2022 Watershed Partners Service mm -hmm. Agreement number 220 uh, 2200410. Mm -hmm. Let's do it that way. With the Rocky River Watershed Council to add the mm -hmm. Cauga Soil and Water Conservation District as the fiscal agent under the agreement. Uh, request for authorization to amend agreement number 1900455 for the Office 365 and Windows <coughs> SQL server licenses under State of Ohio Cooperative Purchasing Program necessary for licensing true up by increasing the agreement amount by $442,029.36, thereby bringing the total agreement amount not to exceed $1,232,029.36. Also, requests for uh, authorizing final adjusting change order for design build agreement number 1900527 with Cold Harbor Building Company for a southerly miscellaneous disinfection and solids handling improvements project by decreasing the agreement amount by $1,192,682.21, thereby bringing the total agreement amount to $4,209,767.92. Move to adopt. Motion by Ms. Chambers. Second. Second by uh, Mayor Alai. Question. Question. Without objection, they approve. Resolution 188 through 190 22. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's go to property related transaction and this is uh, authorization to acquire one parcel in fee simple known as parcel number 761160012 located at 4238 Cricket Lane City of Warrensville Heights owned by Rev Revine W. Gunn uh, necessary for construction and maintenance of Mill Creek restoration near Cricket Lane and Warrensville Heights project to enter into a lease agreement with Ravine W. Gunn and two allow the entirety of the payment to be dispersed to Ohio Real Title Agency LLC with a uh, total consideration of $100,000 plus closing costs. So moved. Motion uh, by Mayor Bacci. Second. Second uh, by Mr. Sulik. Question? There's no question without objection. It's approved. Resolution 191-22. Right. Hearing officer finding and recommendations. <coughs> Adopting the findings of the hearing officer with regard to the sewer count of Omobola Giad Iola D 
Dilo. <laughs> Sewer District hearing number 22006 that the customer that the customer's request be denied. Move for adoption of resolution 19222. Motion by Mayor Lai. Second. I'll take Ms. Dumas as a second. Uh, question? No question. It's been without objection. It is approved. Resolution 192-22. Thank you very much. That was a test. Okay, let's go to uh, the complete action items. Let's go with information items. We have information technology update. Good afternoon, President Brown, members of the board. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So this is the June 2022 update uh, for IT. I'm going to go over select IT projects for the year, uh, a little review of information security, um, some look at IT service performance, process improvements, and some metrics. So one of the bigger projects we have going on this year is the Oracle EBS upgrade. We are currently at version 12.1. Uh, we implemented version 12.1 in 2013, and uh, we had one large roll-up patch in 2016, so we've got a lot of life out of this particular version. The version we're going to is 12.2. It is guaranteed to be supported to 2031. So barring any changes in our business needs, uh, we shouldn't be forced off of this version for quite some time. It also comes with a, a good deal of enhancements. Um, the support for 12.1 ended in December of 2021, however, we are covered because we have the licensing for 12.2. This project will run through the end of the year. Some of the benefits of the Oracle EBS upgrade, we're going to have a new suite of enterprise command centers. These are dashboards. They're built in. They're pre-configured. Uh, and we have dashboards in our Oracle Analytics cloud. The difference is we have to build those dashboards and we have to configure those reports. These are already pre-built and they are in the application so you can drill all the way down to like an invoice document level. So it should help uh, the department quite a bit. It will eliminate some manual interfaces and enhance uh, file automation, taking out human error in some cases. And all of the modules get some additional functionalities, iProcurement, iSupplier, Accounts Payable, and we've been working with purchasing in the finance department to define what those new capabilities are and, and what they need. It also comes with a new online patching feature. Uh, before we'd have to take the system down and make it unavailable and apply the patches and test, uh, now we will be able to apply the patches while the system's up and running, so that will reduce downtime. And it has a new uh, configuration diagnostics feature that will allow you to check at a glance that you are configured in a secure fashion and uh, not allow any openings into the system that could be vulnerabilities. The new version also includes iPad support, and with the proliferation of iPads throughout the district, uh, that's a good thing, so it should help out considerably. Last year I talked about a project called GAR. It was the Gauge Adjusted Rainfall Radar. radar. Uh, this is owned by George Remus. So he does some very interesting things collecting data about rainfall. Um, and so we, the IT department is supporting him by adding several attributes to the database so that he can query them better. Uh, improvements to the summer reports, additional reports, and um, we continue to update monthly rainfall data. So this, this uh, actually I'll go over it in the next, uh, next slide. This looks a little busy, but, uh, but there's a lot of interesting stuff on here. If you look at, across the top, you see things like grid name, communities, uh, subwatershed, watershed. Those are the, those attributes that we've added to the system so that he can filter on, on those to bring up reports. In this case, this report, he's, they specified the community Parma. So this is all Parma data. Uh, and these are all grids. There are 3,410 one by one kilometer grids across our service area. And this is sort of a heat map. So he we are looking at the peak one hour rainfall on July 5th of 2019, because that's the time frame we specified. And we, we sorted it up. 
So, so that top grid there uh, had almost three inches in a one-hour span, which was equivalent to a 200-year event. So you can see the power of this. You can specify a time frame. You can sort it by community, by watershed, by interceptor, everything, and you can see exactly what's going on. So um, the, all this data comes from 51 rain gauges, 30 of which are owned by the district. The others are owned by other municipalities and the airport and some other things for a total of 51. Those rain gauges are then, um, we look at the weather radar and we extrapolate into these one kilometer by one kilometer uh, uh, grids. So a lot of interesting information. We continue to do infrastructure upgrade pro projects. The network infrastructure upgrade, I mentioned that at the last one as well, and I, I said we had some supply chain issues, which were slowing things down. Supply chain issues continue to be an issue. However, we have received a good deal of, of material for a couple of the plants, so we're, we are implementing that. This is the replacement of network equipment that is out of date and needs to be replaced to keep us up to date. Another large project is the SAN replacement, storage area network. This is the equipment that stores our, all our files. We have two big SANs, one here at GJM and one at EMSC. The one here holds 200 terabytes. A terabyte is about 6.5 million printed pages. Um, so that device holds... Uh, you know, a lot of printed pages. <laughs> it's the equivalent to about 260,000 filing cabinets worth of information. Of course, the data is in there. That's in there is databases, all kinds of other things. But it's a lot of data to move around, a lot of data to back up. We implemented that SAN in May of 2009, so we've gotten two, 13 years out of it, uh, which is very good. But we've picked the vendor uh, that's going to do the replacement. We're, we'll replace the one at GJM and EMSC. We continue infrastructure upgrades like VMware, which is our virtual uh, software environment, virtual servers, and selected small conference room upgrades to improve connectivity, make people be able to attend virtually, put cameras in the room, uh, Honeywell system so that people can talk back and forth to remote locations. Um, as requested and where it, where it makes sense. Uh, we've been building some applications for overtime uh, for a number of the departments. Ma maintenance services, fleet services, and SSMO are already using the application. We are improving it and making enhancements in reporting. And we just completed a POC for the Southerly Maintenance Group and they had a lot of suggestions. Uh, we did do the POC, so we are moving down that road as well. Some future projects, we're working with our uh, new HR director about uh, case management and performance management implementation within our UKG system, and we continue to look to implement the electronic bidding system uh, to remove that from being a manual process. Information security is an ongoing activity. Uh, the group, which is interdepartmental and has representation from almost, almost everywhere across the district, continues to draft policies uh, and refine the processes and uh, make recommendations for the annual training for all of the staff at the district. It's, it's different. If you're in finance, you're going to have a different set of training than if you're in SSMO. It depends on your exposure to sensitive data and your access. Uh, the deadline for the completing that training is June 30th, so we are, we are sending reminders out, but I'm confident we'll have that training completed. We continue to update the IT incidents and response and disaster recovery plans. We made a lot of progress so far conducting business impact analysis and uh, documenting where things are. So we're trying to button up the gaps and make sure that the business's expectations about what we, we can re recover and how fast we can recover it meets the, the capabilities of IT. Um, we, I mentioned when Shola was speaking that uh, at the next board meeting and executive session, we're going to provide an update to security, in the, and it will be an in-depth uh, discussion about all the technologies we use, where we're at, any exposures, et cetera. So um, look forward to that.
Uh, incident service requests. Um, all I'm going to say about this, the top is the monthly chart, the bottom is yearly. We have seen year over year increases in the number of annual cases that the help desk is handling. We'll have to see uh, at the end of the year how 2022 shapes up. Uh, it looks like we're on track for the same kind of volume. As far as process improvements go, this, is the, this dashboard is the change control dashboard. One of the major improvements we made here is that we added a subtask to every change control item. That subtask calls for the manager of the group that made the change to go back and review the change after the change has been completed. In addition, and that's documented, in addition to that, quarterly, five IT managers and myself review, review all of the, the changes that have occurred in that quarter and sign off on them and make sure that they made sense. So uh, this was an audit recommendation, and uh, it's been implemented. Uh, customer service satisfaction. If you'll recall, our ShareWell system, which is our, our, I just showed you the graph of how many tickets we have. Every ticket that goes out, we follow up with a survey, and we measure certain areas. Our, my personal target was to be always above, above 4.85 uh, out of 5 for our customer satisfaction. Uh, we've gone up a little bit. We're at 4.97. So um, this re reflects the work of not just the service desk, but, but the rest of the IT team since they all handle tickets. Well, that concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions? No. No. Thank you for your presentation, sir. Great. All right. That takes care of our information item. Anything for open session? No. Uh, Madam CEO, has anybody signed up for the public session portion of our agenda to speak on any subject matter? They have not, Mr. President. Thank you. Then we have no matter for executive session? No, sir, Mr. President, we do not. Then that completes our agenda for the day, and I am willing to entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion, Mr. President. Motion. Second. Motion by Mayor Bachi, second by Ms. Dumas. There are no objections. We are adjourned. Thank you.